station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We're ready for the event, Houston. WCSH TV, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Yes, station, this is WCSH TV. Do you hear me? Loud and clear, good morning to Maine from the International Space Station. Hey. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? We're we doing are great. Talking it's with, our uh, afternoon. Flight. We've had a... I'm sorry. You Go ahead. Go ahead. No, we're doing great. It's a privilege gonna, to be, uh, to be here. I was just going <laughs> to... You go ahead, Chris. You you go ahead. I'll be quiet. You, you go ahead. I'll be quiet. Okay. No. So uh, as you said, I'm Chris NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy here with my crewmate Tom Marsh for an Expedition 35 on the International Space Station, and just really excited to be here and share a little bit about our day with uh, Maine television watchers. Well, it's fantastic to have you, and and Chris, as you remember, I'm sure we spoke to you just a little bit before you blasted off and headed up to the space. Station. And the first thing I want to ask you is, is I, I was unaware at that time that you were going to take the express route up to the space station. I understand you got there a lot faster than is usual. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what you did to do that, to accomplish that. Yeah, that was interesting. Typically, um when we launch to the space station, we'll, we'll uh, launch, go to bed, wake up, have a whole day of, of maneuvers in between, and on the third day, we'll rendezvous to the space station. However, on our uh, launch, we did something a little bit different, and we did the same day rendezvous, which six hours after lifting off in Kazakhstan, we were docked here to the space station. And essentially, in the cockpit, we did all of the same tasks as we would do over that three-day period, except it was a little bit more squished together. Uh, it was really cool to be uh, just walking on Earth and then later on have my next meal on board the space station with Tom and Chris. I know it's kind of like flying from, uh, you know, Portland to Los Angeles or something. It really didn't take all that long. What was the reason behind trying to get there a lot faster? Well, that's a great question. You know, um, it allows us sometimes if we're doing a uh, carrying sensitive cargo that has temperature constraints or some type of deep freeze type uh, sample that needs to get to the space station quickly. It opens up opportunities for scientific uh, exploration like that. And also it's a little bit more comfortable for the crew uh, in terms of that that one day inside the Soyuz we do sort of a, if, if you do the normal ro ro uh, rendezvous program, there's a solar spin attitude that can be a little disorienting inside the cockpit, and, and um, it's really nice to do your space adaptation here on the space station in a much larger volume. So it's just kind of good all the way around to get here faster. All right, that makes sense <laughs> to those of us back on Earth. Uh, Dr. Marshburn, I wanted to ask you, you've been up there for some time now. Um, is, is one of your many jobs to kind of help acclimate the new guy who's coming in? You know, it's written on the schedule for that to be one of the jobs, but with uh, Chris Cassidy here, uh, it doesn't seem like he's needed it. He's adapted right away, and we've been fully functional, it seems like, from day one. So uh, it hasn't needed much uh, orienteering at all. We know a little bit about Chris's history and how he came from York, Maine, and, and, and went uh, through, you know, all the way to becoming an astronaut. What was, the, what was your path to becoming an astronaut? Well, like a, a lot of uh, astronauts, it started pretty early, and I was in high school when I decided I wanted to work for NASA after reading uh, about some satellites and robotic operations in uh, the school library. I never thought I'd get to be an astronaut, but I followed the paths of a lot of uh, career astronauts and copied them just because it was so much fun and uh, offered, so many, offered so many opportunities in life. And I ended up working at NASA and then applying and getting in. So it was a long road, but it was a lot of fun. I'm very curious about what, what your day is like. Now, I know you have lots of jobs you have to do while you're on the space station, but do you wake up at the same time every day? Are you going on Eastern Standard Time? Who wakes you up? 
That's a that's a fun question to answer because there's mission control centers all around the world who are who are uh, participating in our day. So what time do we live by? And the answer to that is Greenwich Mean Time. We wake up at around six o'clock uh, Greenwich Mean Time. So basically, we're we're one meal ahead of you in Maine, and uh, and. We'll go. We'll have a morning tag up with the ground about 7:30, and then get right to work. We're talking to you right now from the Japanese module, where there's quite a bit of scientific experiments that we participate in. In fact, this morning I was working right behind the camera earlier, and uh, and we'll do various things, uh, experiments, maintenance, and exercise to keep ourselves healthy, um, and then wrap the day up with another conference with the ground around 7 p.m., and then have a little bit of of uh, personal time to take care of things like eating and all the other human needs. Uh, before we go to bed for the evening. <laughs> now that Japanese module, is that uh, common size in terms of, of the modules up there? Is that the most spacious or are, is, there, is there like a luxury module that you're not showing us? <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom and I don't get we we're just government employees so we didn't we didn't pay for the uh the the XLE model but uh <laughs> but no this the Japanese module is very bright as you can see and it, you can see it's very bright and large and spacious uh there the other modules are similar in size although I would say this is probably the feels the largest volume um and the nice thing about the Japanese module, it has a closet upstairs, so all of the clutter in the bags gets stored up above our heads right now. And some of the other modules has the same amount of stuff, just you, it would, you see it on the floor and tied down with, with uh, cords. But each module is unique in its own way, uh, and with the, what it brings to either space station systems it keep, takes to keep us running and keep all the system lights on, so to speak, or experiments. So it's, it's really fun to explore and get to, be, get to know each, uh, each room, so to speak. Now, I can't see your feet in terms of how the camera is framed. Are you guys just kind of floating there right now? Are you tied down because you're, you seem to be, oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, just using our feet you know, uh, hooked up under handrails. Uh, we kind of use our feet like our hands. Interesting. Okay. And, and I mean, aside from, from the fact that you guys are scientists and you're doing serious work there, it has to be fun to just kind of float around every now and then. It, it's amazing. I, I like to tell school kids when, I, when I'm back on Earth giving a talk, imagine in this gymnasium that we're sitting in, all, instead of sitting in chairs, everybody's floating around. And if you want to go to the ceiling, you just push off. And that's what it's like. We, uh, we still think like we're on the ground, just like uh, normal. And so it's just as interesting for us every single day to float through the module or to go from the floor to the ceiling. And an interesting experiment I like to do in what is to tell myself that I'm now on the side and without moving my body at, all, body at all, then tell myself, okay, now I'm sitting on the ceiling. And once you get acclimated, you can easily do that transformation in your head. And it's, it's really fun to do. Boy, I imagine it is. Now, I know we've seen some pictures of the Earth uh, taken from uh, up in space. Is there a window close to you that you can just look right out and see the Earth always, or it, does it depend on, on where you are in terms of your, uh, your, you know, your place around the Earth? As a matter of fact, there are two windows that are very nice behind us here in the gym. Oh, it's nice. and, the, and unfortunately, it's nighttime right now. We think we're over the Pacific Ocean somewhere, and it's night. We see uh, nighttime 16 times a day here. Uh, but there is a beautiful uh, seven-windowed dome called the cupola. And that's the most popular viewing area. You get a big 360 view of the Earth, which is, when you have your head in there, is above you. So uh, we're actually upside down looking at it. But it's a beautiful place, and it's uh, magnetizing. We just can't get away from it. Boy, I imagine it must be fascinating, it must be wonderful. It's been wonderful talking to you both. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know you have a lot going on. Uh, again, uh, Expedition 35 flight engineers Chris Cassidy from Maine and Dr. Tom Marshburn. Guys, thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Have a great day. And next week is Maine Space Week, so stay tuned for all you kids out there. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the WCSH-TV portion of the event. 
Please stand by for a voice check from Sirius XM Radio. Hello, hello. You want me to talk? Hello, is this uh, Tim? Welcome on board the International Space Station. Oh, we're talking. Wonderful. Yeah, this is, uh, okay, uh, Tim Farley here from Sirius XM. Uh, by the way, also a, uh, a Bangor-born fellow, went to Colby College, so I have something in common with Mr. Cassidy, Commander Cassidy. Commander Cassidy. Oh, very good. It's nice to talk to, to, to uh, Maynard today. Right. They don't let you take whoopie pies in space, do they? Hey, up. Uh uh, gentlemen, first, I, I wanted to ask a question. First, it, it's great to be able to speak to you here on uh, Sirius XM Satellite Radio going nationwide, coast to coast. Uh, can you give us a sense of where you are right now? We're about noontime, East Coast. Where are you? Uh, right now, the entire space station is, uh, we think, in the Southern Pacific, going 17,500 miles an hour towards you, uh, heading for uh, the United States. And um, we are in the forward part of the space station, so we are, we are surrounded all around us by uh, the vacuum of outer space, except in one direction where the main axis of the space station is. All right. Dr. Tom Marshburn is on board, as well as Chris Cassidy, Christopher Cassidy, Commander. Uh, Dr. Marshburn, I want to ask you about it. First of all, is this your first time into space? Uh, nope. I came up actually with uh, Chris Cassidy here. We flew together on the shuttle Endeavor back in 2009. We came here to the space station. That time, though, we did a lot of uh, spacewalks. We were involved in a construction mission to finish, help finish the completion of this space station. And maybe you could give us, uh, Dr. Marshburn, Marshburn, just a little rundown of what the mission is about that you're on right now. Well, right now, the station is complete. It's a full-up operating laboratory, and our mission is to carry out uh, many experiments. We have over 130 experiments just right now going on uh, during our increment. So our job is to be the eyes and the hands of all the scientists around the world uh, to uh, help uh, their experiments come to completion. We uh, resupply the experiments. We fix them if they break, and also involved in the maintaining the space station to keep it running. Uh, Chris Cassidy, again, commander who is on board, uh, first Navy SEAL ever to, uh, I guess, serve as an astronaut in space. It must be different. I, I can imagine the terrain, the territory, when you get into a place like Afghanistan where you serve one thing, then outer space, something different. Give us a sense of what it's like being in space with alone just with a few guys when you're that far from Earth. Well, as, as with most things in life, what really, uh, what really makes things special is the people that you share it with. And uh, I'm really, really privileged to have fantastic crewmates, Tom and, uh, and Chris Hadfield, our Canadian commander, and our three Russian uh, cosmonauts. And that's really what makes it special. Just like when I was in the, mili in the Navy and deploying to crazy places, um, what, what it made that time really memorable for me is my platoon mates and, and, uh, and folks that I served in the military with. So it's very much similar here. And just for the record, uh, there was one other SEAL who was the first commander of the space station, Bill Shepard, and I, I'm the second one to follow in his footsteps. So it's a real uh, privilege to be in the, that company with him. All right. Well, I appreciate your correction on that one. Uh, I, was, I was noting, and I'm reading, and maybe you guys can fill me in on this, whoever wants to take the question, but I, I saw a story about an antenna that had a problem to deploy and it might make uh, some, uh, some docking difficult with the space station. Is that an up-to-date story? Yep, that's the story as we've got it. It's called the Progress Vehicle. It's cargo. It doesn't have people in it, but it has some important supplies in it. But, you know, we can, we can really only barely do this space flight thing. It's complicated. Uh, these things happen, and we've got backup plans uh, in case it can't actually physically dock to the space station because of this antenna problem. But we know in uh, Moscow they're working hard to fix it, and we know the back backup plan is in work. So we're just w waiting to see what happens and hope the uh, hardware cooperates. And the backup plan, I understand, Stand is, is a spacewalk, is that correct? Uh, as far as we've heard, that's right. That's one of the backup plans, yes. Yeah. Either, are, either one of you ever done any spacewalking? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, we'll both answer that one. Uh, we've done two together on our shuttle flight, and we've each done three. So uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's one of the pinnacles of flying in space. I'll let Chris tell you a little bit about it. 
You know, it's one, it's one thing to be looking out the window. It's amazing. We have this room called the cupola here on the space station with windows all around. It's one thing to be looking at from inside the vehicle, but when you open that hatch and step outside, and the only thing between you and uh, the amazing Earth below you is your bubble of a helmet, it really gets your attention, and, and you and uh, you appreciate where you are and how fast you're moving, and that those first few seconds you hold on to the handrail and say, okay, I'm not going to fall, I'm not going to fall, and then you kind of get used to it, and before you know it, it feels just like our training in the pools. Our, we have a really, really great place to train in the in the pool there in Houston. So uh, it's 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 amazing doing a spacewalk, though. It's incredible. Do you actually feel the speed? I mean, there's no resistance. There's no air. There's nothing to carry sound. I mean, give us a sense of what that is like. What's the sensation on your body? On your body, you feel you don't feel anything. It's it's all with your eyes, and um, as you see, there, we're going 17,500 miles an hour, five miles a second, which is really fast. And you see that in the motion of the clouds and the Earth below you. But if you're focusing just on uh, a piece of metal, for instance, right in front of you, that you're doing your work on the spacewalk with, um, you can't sense any motion other than the little moving around that you're doing, trying to keep yourself stable. But in terms of uh, with respect to the earth it's only when your eyes glance down there do you get a sense of how fast you're moving once again we're talking to dr thomas marshburn he's one of the astronauts on board the international space station as is commander christopher cassidy they're joining us here on potus as we are live and i started gentlemen with the in the beginning with the where are you and i wonder is there a way for you to know if people are going to be able to see you i know it was about a month and a half two months ago i was able to actually go in my backyard one night and see uh, the space station is is one of those viewings going to be possible coming up soon You know, there's, uh, there are apps, applications, and uh, c many websites. You can go to the uh, nasa.gov website, and uh, they'll give you the exact time and the azimuth, that is the angle above the horizon, that the space station shows up in anyone's particular area. So lots of viewing opportunities. You know, the Earth precesses under our orbit, so it's not every orbit that we come over every spot. Uh, but there uh, should be plenty of viewing opportunities for any one of these many uh, uh, software applications you can uh, look at. Well, I know you're very busy, and I know you've been doing a lot of talking to a lot of people today, and I wish I was as smart about this mission as a lot of other reporters. I don't cover it regularly, but it's always fascinating to talk to people who do what you do, and I know that uh, it's been a change in the in the way that the space program is, but still I know a lot of Americans watch and listen and know and think of you guys as heroes in space, and we just want to pass that along. Thank you very much for joining us, and Godspeed on, on your work ahead. We appreciate that, Tim, very much. It was really enjoyable talking to you. Thank you. Thank you both. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event.